yeah, there's me again. Um, the image is definitely not taken from today. Um, so I want to introduce you to my own package, um, ZyncTrack, which uh, utilizes DVC pipelines in Python and Jupyter. And as a quick start, um, I want to give you some background on myself. So uh, I'm coming from a background of computational physics and currently doing my PhD in the topic of machine learned potential energy surfaces. So we have a lot of steps there, like simulating data selection, then training model, once again, doing simulations and then doing post-processing. And I don't want to go into any detail here. This is just for background, um, but there are some challenges that come with that. And because this is not all done in a single day, there are a lot of hyperparameters that we have to keep track of. There are different simulation engines that we want to use, different types of models, and also potentially different students working on that topic. So uh, the challenge of reproducibility really quickly comes ahead. If you see like, okay, how did you get to this data? How did you get there? And so on and so forth. And with that also shareability of data, if you have a lot of data, you might want to either share the data directly, or if it's terabytes of data, you might want to share a script that allows you to reproduce that data on your own machine, because it might be more cost efficient to rerun the simulation than sharing the large amounts of data actually. And also um, deployment of the machine learning model in the end. And here is where DVC, uh, Came, handy, came in handy for us because a lot of those steps can be uh, done in a DVC pipeline, putting like all those steps of running simulation on your computational graph and making them reproducible, reproducible and also easily to share with others. So this is a little bit of an introduction where I'm coming from and how I got uh, introduced to DVC. And now I want to take an example from the DVC wiki or the DVC documentation um, to show how I got uh, the idea of uh, developing the ZyncTrack package. I don't want to use my own examples because the scripts will be very lengthy. So here we take the preparing, featureization, and training of a model. And if we take a look at the featureize step um, in the, in the uh, documentation, we use the command line interface, but you could also write those DVC YAML files manually yourself. Um, then in addition to that, we have the parameters file, either YAML, JSON, or Python file. I mean, uh, I guess uh, most of you are very familiar with that. And once again, we also have a Python script or some other tool, uh, which we can use to, in this uh, case, featureize our data set. And if we take a close look at those more or less configuration files, we see that, for example, in the case of parameters, um, they appear multiple times. So they appear in the dvc.yaml file, they appear in the params.yaml file, and also in our Python script, uh, we read them again. And in this case, they're also hard-coded there. There are ways to get around that a little bit, but this was a little bit the background from uh, which I encountered writing those scripts that I had to put them through the command line interface or in the YAML file, in the parameters file, and also read them from the parameters file again into my Python script during the DVC run command, a DVC repro command. So my idea was, why not manage all of this inside Python? And at this point, I want to highlight, I really like the idea of DVC, DVC being language agnostic uh, to work with all kinds of tools because in the computational uh, physics department, we also use a lot of tools that do not really nicely interface with Python. Uh, they're often legacy tools that are really old or something like that and get developed and they use some input scripts like um, to run the simulations, for example. On the other hand, because those input scripts are not uh, YAML or JSON input scripts, I found myself using some templating languages like Jinja2 to write those input scripts. And once again, was back in Python and put my parameters through Python to those pipeline, uh, to those uh, simulation engines. So I came up with the idea of managing all these dependencies, parameters, and outputs in the Python script, more or less building the computational graph there itself, uh, and all, only using DVC in the back end, more or less, uh, still having those files, but somewhat managing them through the scripts. So let's take a look at a quick example. This is a very simple node on our computational graph, which just computes a random number and writes that random number into a file. So um, what we have here is uh, we use the add notify decorator from the ZyncTrack package to convert this uh, function into a node on our computational graph. 
we pass in some parameters that will be stored in the parameters.yaml file. So in this case, we have our max parameter for the random number between zero and that maximum number. And we define an output. So in this case, it's just a text file number.text. The actual core of that uh, function, which will be executed by DBC, uh, takes only a single argument. And this is this node config object. This node config object is a data class object that gives you access to, for example, in this case, the outs and the parms, but also all the other, uh, all the other DBC uh, options like plots, metrics, metrics no cache, and so on. And because we're using uh, the Pathlib library here, we can uh, make use of the uh, write text method of that library and write the uh, computed random number into that file. And for the random number, we use the parameter uh, where we can here either access this via this dot dict, or we can use get item because in principle it's just an altered dictionary. Uh, with this definition given, uh, we want to actually build our graph. So we call the DVC command, and we can do this by uh, calling that function. And by default, SyncTrack will always call the function with no execute um, because I encountered that I often build my graphs in a Python script and then uh, run them with DVC repro separately. But in this case, it's a very small function, so you can pass run equals true or no execute equals false, which are basically the same arguments to it. Uh, to run that directly and get the results. So this would be the dvc.yaml file and the parms.yaml file associated with that uh, node. Um, we see here that the command is just importing this uh, function and then calling it with execute function equals true. And uh, the parms and outs are defined as we put it to the decorator and we have this parms.yaml file. So we can also edit those files and then uh, use dvc repro as usual, uh, we don't have to go necessarily through Python. So with this, I gave a quick introduction into a very lightweight approach, in my opinion, to create a node based on DVC on the graph. You just put a decorator on it, plug in the parameters, define the outputs, and you're basically done. So all the outputs uh, of DVC, I hope all the outputs of DVC are supported, um, like mentioned plots, metrics, and so forth. And also the arguments to the DVC run commands like um, external or always changed can be passed through the function call itself. And this approach mostly works through file paths. So what I mean by that, you can see in just a minute because there is another way of creating a node in ZyncTrack that is more based on an object-oriented approach than this defining a function. So to start that, we take the same example of a random number generator, but here I put that in a data class-like structure. So we have a start value, we have a stop value, and we have the number as a result. All of those are integers in this case. And we also have an additional method, the run method, which computes this random number for us. And if we take this data class approach, uh, we can directly relate this to how it would be written in ZyncTrack. Instead of the decorator, we use class inheritance. So we inherit from the ZyncTrack node. You define the start and stop values as ZyncTrack parameters, in this case, also 0 and 10. And we define the output, in this case, an integer value as well as a ZyncTrack output. And then we have the run method, which does the computation, which would be executed by DVC. So all your heavy lifting will happen in that run method. There is one thing here that I mentioned before, um, that the notify decorator heavily depends on file paths. In this example, we don't have a file path. And there are two ways to handle that. And I want to show them here side by side to highlight the benefits or maybe downsides of both of them. So on the left side, we define a dvc.outs. And usually everything that starts with dvc.something is related to a file path. And on the right side, we define zinc.outs, which in this case is an integer value. So if you would load the node on the left after it has been executed, and I will show an example of that later on, uh, and you access the number attribute of that class, you get a pathlib object that you have to read manually. If you do the same thing on the right, you actually get that integer number 
or for example, a NumPy array or a string, whatever you compute and can work with that without worrying about how it was serialized and deserialized for you. And there are a few uh, already existing serializers in the ZyncTrack package, but you can easily add your own. And I will show you an example of that also, where we do this for a TensorFlow model so that you can save your TensorFlow model automatically. So um, there are not necessarily file names required. And it is a very similar way of defining a node compared to data sets, uh, to data classes. So uh, in my opinion, it's a very structured way to organize your parameters and your outputs and dependencies and so on. And because it's an object-oriented approach uh, and it's based on a class, you can uh, split your run method easily up into different methods. But you can also add methods later on that depend on the results of your computation to, for example, visualize them. So if you have a data preprocessing step of images, you could have a plot method and then look at the results um, after DVC has been executed. So with this introduction, uh, I want to go into a more hands-on example. Uh, and for this, I'm taking the MNIST uh, sign language data set. Uh, which is available on the uh, Kaggle website. And the example we're going through is available here on this uh, GitHub page. If you want to code along, uh, you can open the binder instance. This hopefully works. Um, so what we will do is uh, we will download the data set. Then we'll run a preparation of the data for our training data. We do the same thing for our test data. We train a model. And then in the end, we evaluate that train model on the training data on the test data. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's have a look at how this looks like. So, yeah. Please ignore that. So, okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, because we're on Binder and we're using Kaggle, I have to set up my Kaggle account. Um, and I prepared this little script for everyone who wants to do the same thing. Um, so ah, restart the kernel. So this will ask for. Oh, this one's. And then. Like in my credentials here, don't want to save them. And then this should be fine. So the first thing we have to do now is we have to tell ZyncDrag that we're working in a Jupyter notebook. Um, and we do this by importing the config object and then saying notebook name in this case is uh, workflow.ipython. For the actual model, I'm using TensorFlow. So there are a bunch of TensorFlow imports. I'm also using uh, Pandas and NumPy for some pre-processing using the Pathlab library and the Kaggle package to download the actual data set. So while this is importing, we can look, have a look at our first node. So our first node, uh, I'll use the notify decorator and I'll define an output here, which is uh, just data set directory. And as a parameter, uh, I also have to parameter data set which is the name of the data set. And what I do then is I say download files. The data set is this config parameter. So data set, so this one. And the output we also can access to the config object is the data set directory. I don't want to uh, run this node immediately. Uh, I want to build my graph first. So I don't pass any run equals true here. Just call that function. And now it will run the DVC command for us. And it will also return this node config object so we can check that everything looks correct. So we see here the parameters have been set correctly, the outs have been set correctly, and all the others are set to none. So with this, our downloading data set node is done. And we can take a look at how to pre-process the data. Um, for pre-processing the data, uh, we first uh, use the node, so the object-oriented one uh, way of defining a node. 
We define a dependency, so in this case, data, which is a pathlib object. We use dvc.dependencies and then use the data set that we passed previously to the previous node. We also define data set here as a parameter because there are two data sets in this downloaded data set from Kaggle. And we define the outputs. And here, as the outputs, we have the features and the labels. And they're both NumPy arrays. And therefore, we can just say we use syncdrag.outs for them so we don't manually serialize them. We'll let syncdrag serialize them for us. So in the run method, uh, what we'll then do is we say, OK, our features here are the values of our data frame. And for the labels, um, it's also a NumPy array. And we have an additional uh, method here, which is called plot image, which we can use later on to visualize uh, the image with the given ID. To put that on a graph, uh, we don't only call our class because we would create a new instance of the class. We actually call the uh, write graph method uh, to let DVC know uh, or to call the DVC command and put that on the graph. So now we have downloading data and data pre-processing, and we want to go along and at the next step, train a model. But before we do that, uh, I want to show you how we can manually serialize a TensorFlow model. So because here, there is no saving involved. It just says um, we define our features, and at the end of the run method, the features will be saved for us. So we want to do something very similar with our model. And therefore, we have to define a new ZingTrack option. The syntax option will have the DVC command outs. So you could also use outs no cache, for example, here if you would like to store them by Git. And the syntax type is usually, almost in all cases, the results type. So there are th three things now that we have to do. First, we need to define a name. <clears throat> and in this case, it is useful to make the name dependent on the name of our node. So Therefore, we use this method here and just not hard code it and say, okay, nodes, then node name, and then we will call it a model. So either this will be a file or a directory. In the next step, um, we'll have the save method. For the save method, um, there are three things we will do. First, we will get the actual model from our class. Uh, therefore, we have to call this a get command. The arguments won't change, it will always look the same. We have to get the file. And then in the last step, uh, we call model.save here, which will save the model to the file. This is a, a TensorFlow Keras internal method. And when we save that, we also want to load it. So we do the same thing. We'll get the file name. We use uh, keras.model.load from file. We pass the file and then return our model. So this way, we define how to serialize and deserialize our model. And that's it. We're basically done for this part. So we run that. And now uh, we come to my favorite node in this graph because it shows a lot of the features. Um, the first one is the dependencies. Prior to this, we defined the dependencies as dvc.dependency and had a path as a dependency. Here, our dependency is a node object. So what we can do is we don't have to define the path, but we can actually define the node object itself as a dependency. So our train data will be an instance of our data preprocessor uh, with all the attributes available that have been computed in the run method, because this will be called after the run method has been called on our data preprocessor. So what this allows us to do is here, when we train our model, and sorry for skipping a little bit through the code. Um, we say model.fit, and then we say self.trainedata.features and self.trainedata.labels. So these two attributes from our data preprocessor we can now use in this next node uh, without loading them. There will be number arrays just as we expect them to be. Um, furthermore, we define ZingTrack plots and ZingTrack metrics. The plots here um, for now have to be a pandas data frame. There might be other ways to do that, but uh, uh, for now restricted to data frames. And metrics can be a dictionary of uh, keys and then some uh, usually floats. So in this case, it will be accuracy and loss. And we define our model. And here 
we use this TF model that we defined previously, uh, just like the other ones, and say model is a TF model. And as a parameter, in this case, I only defined the training epochs as a parameter, but in the real case scenario, you would probably define also your uh, structure of your model, like the uh, neurons and the types of layers and stuff like that. So this might be way longer. We also have an init, and uh, I added this init here, um, although it might not be necessary, um, because the, there will be an automatically generated init for all uh, parameters and also for um, DVC dot uh, dependencies, for example, and also the sync track dependencies. But I defined this init here to highlight that it is very important to include a super call. Um, if you don't, it will probably not work. And then we pass the epochs here, uh, which we default to three. And uh, we also have the optimizer here, which could probably also be a parameter. And for the run method, um, I split it up into two methods uh, defining our model. So you see that self.model is a Keras sequential model. And then we train our model. And you see that after self.model.fit, nothing happens to that uh, model anymore. So this will automatically be saved and then can be used to the next node. So let's also write the graph for this one. And let's continue. So previously, uh, we used the data preprocessor for uh, preparing our training data. But now we want to do the same thing for our test data. And we don't necessarily want to write the same uh, class again, because it does the same thing. Uh, but we can also, we can't uh, really use the exactly same function because we would overwrite the previous node. So the node usually or automatically is called by the name, uh, has the same name as our class. What we do here is we give it a custom name, uh, use the uh, test data set here as the data set uh, parameter, and then write the graph. And then this will put the node with the different parameter also in our graph. And as a last step, uh, we have the evaluation of the model. So here we have two dependencies. The first dependency is our model itself. So we just do that as we did previously with the data preprocessor. We say it's linked to dependencies, ML model. And this allows us to do self.mlmodel.model.evaluate, which is also a Keras function to get our loss and accuracy. Then we define the test data as a dependency. And this dependency uh, has a name. So we need to also uh, submit this dependency with that name. So it doesn't use the training data, but it uses the test data to evaluate. And we can do this in the automatically generated init, where we say test data equals data preprocessor.load, and then have the name here. Obviously, you could also do this, but um, this doesn't show that you can pass it through the init. And we also define the metrics here, uh, which again is a dictionary of loss and accuracy. So let's also put that on our graph. And then call this again and see that everything looks as we expect it to look. So to run this, I will open a terminal and just call DVC repro. And now this will download our data set. And now we see that the data set directory has been created for us, the cache has been created, and now uh, the graph will be executed. Um, while this is running in the background, I want to go through the created files. So the dcc.yaml file um, has all the steps of the graph in it. Um, what you can see here is, and you might have spotted it earlier, that due to the support is still an experimental feature. So I'm creating a Python file based on every node defined in my Jupyter notebook. And they will be put here in this source directory. So here are the Python files associated with each, each um, node. So I will run, it will import the uh, respective node, call it with a uh, load, equals and then passes the name. So in this case, just a default name, and then call run and save. 
And for the outputs here, uh, the outputs will be stored in the respective nodes directory, then the name of the node, and then there will be a JSON file uh, where you can, if you have something like an integer, directly look at them. And if you have something like a, in this case, NumPy array, it will be serialized for you by, uh, and you can't really uh, look at the results. We also have the params.yaml file and here you see all the parameters. And I have to admit, I cheated a little bit here. So my model will be a little bit better than it actually is because I'm using the test data on the data preprocessing training and testing. Uh, the reason I did this is it's just faster. Uh, so usually you would like to have a train here. And the last file that will be generated is the zinc.json file. And this file uh, contains internal information of how ZincTrack works. So for example, for the ML model, we have the train data and I somehow need to store uh, what is passed here. So uh, there might be some uh, redundant information here, but the important part is that you need to track that file uh, in your uh, DVC workflow, but you do not really have to look at it. If you, uh, th there shouldn't be anything in that file that you want to change compared to parameters file, for example. So if we go back to our terminal, we see that everything ran through. So the last part I want to show is that we can actually work with those nodes in this Jupyter notebook. So for example, we have the ML model class and we can load that class. And then we can look at the metrics, for example. So we see here, these are the metrics of our model. And we can also look at the model itself. So we have the model here. So here is our sequential model with um, all the weights, they're also there. So all this information is available and is now loaded into memory. So a nice thing is, if you would have a second model, you have now this matrix in memory, you can load up that second model and can compare them in your Jupyter notebook, for example. The same thing uh, goes for data preprocessor. So we can also load this one and then look at the, um, let's say features. And now we have here our training features. And for the name, uh, we can, as we might have spotted before, you can pass here the names and be data preprocessor test. Copy that. Um, and uh, in the newest version, you can also uh, use this, which is a little bit shorter, uh, to also load it by the name. So, and uh, what I wanted to show is, you say plot image and then pass an image here. Uh, we can have a look at the at the image that has been downloaded and probably reshaped and uh, normalized for us. So with this, I want to go back to my presentation and I have a little outlook and summary slide at the end. So uh, in my idea for ZincTrack was that it makes it easier to define DVC pipelines in Python and also in Jupyter Notebooks, where some people of the community which come from a data science background might be more familiar with than uh, command line interfaces and editing config files. And it is also another uh, more or less native Python tool uh, that is based on DVC in the back end, which has the language agnostic feature, but is integrated with Python, so it can compare a little bit more like with tools like MLflow or Hydra, which uh, works similar to, for example, Hydra works very similar to the Notify decorator. There are also some other features that I didn't show here. For example, you can collect metadata. So there is a way to add a time it decorator, which will automatically generate a metric for you to show you the uh, edge computation time, so the time of the run method it took uh, to run. And I also have some ideas for the future. So one idea is I want to have a better support for Jupyter Notebooks. You can directly import uh, classes from Jupyter Notebooks, but that's a little bit tricky. So I'm still working on that. And one thing I'd really like to look into is um, 
at the load methods to just pass like the revision or the um, name of your DVC experiment. And then you can load up different experiments in your Python kernel and can compare them there. So you can look at the metrics and stuff like that through the DVC metrics difference command, so DVC show command, but you could also do the same thing uh, through a Python script or a Jupyter notebook. And one thing that is different from this, but it's also uh, something we encountered is we wrote a DVC node for a simulator and we saw, hey, we could share that node with others. So we have now a node that is more or less an interface to a simulator, or um, for example, could also be like a, a model that takes some inputs and produces some outputs. And because it is designed as a node, it is inherently reproducible because all the parameters are tracked, all the outputs are tracked. And uh, we're currently writing a package um, internally for our research that allows us uh, to more or less as a collection of those nodes, which you can put together and share with others so that you can just say, hey, um, use that node on your own data and um, see what comes out and you can like develop those nodes in a, from a little bit of community. So concluding that, um, if you have any questions, um, we're sure uh, go through them after this presentation. You can also go onto our GitHub. Um, on the Zingware GitHub, we have some other projects we're working on. Um, the Python FZ GitHub is my personal one. You feel free to write me an email. Um, install Git, uh, install ZingTrack if you like it. Uh, play around with it. Let me know what you think about it. Uh, and if you like it, I would uh, obviously also like uh, a star. <laughs> and um, on the right side are my affiliations from the University of Stuttgart, uh, working at the Institute for Computational Physics. So great. thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabian. Does anybody have any questions? I, I could talk, yeah. I mean, there are some my question was only about the um, serialization, the also serialization. Could it potentially break in any scenario? Um, so the uh, there there were cases where it broke, but I hope I I, I fixed them. Um, so you can, for example, if you take here the the init. Um, you can play around with the parameters uh, as much as you'd like. Um, the parameters are saved um, when you call write graph. So they are not immediately saved, but they're saved at a certain point. And I hope this avoids that there are issues uh, with that. This answers your question. Right, yeah, but I mean, well, also when you save them and then you load them later, you would have to mm -hmm. load them in the same order, right? Um, so, I mean, uh, I don't know. I don't know about the internals of these functions because I haven't used them. But if you yeah. if you do a ZM params, if you call that twice, that that locks in the order that you called it, right? So epoch equals ZM params. Um, yes. If after that you then said, I don't know, learning rate equals Z in params, mm -hmm. it means those those parameters have to be defined in that order. Now you can't swap it around in the load function. Uh, you can. Um, so the parameter is uh, associated with this name. So you can't have two epochs. But um, right. Okay. Function. So so when you call Z in params, it somehow knows the name of the variable it's been assigned to. Yes. Nice Python that's, magic. That's the the descriptor in some Python release. I don't know which one had a nice uh, awesome internal function. And uh, yeah, I was not a first. I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's that's an awesome feature, but at the same time, it's such an anti pattern and it's not supported by any other programming language. I don't know if you can shoot yourself in the foot with it, but it seems awesome at the same time. Yeah, yeah. This uh, if you if you look at the params here. You will see that um, epochs equals three. So yeah, uh, th this nice. is this is loaded loaded like this. But I know there are like in the in the beginning there were main, way more hacky features in ZingTrack, and uh, I was exploring the world of what you can all do with Python. And then I come back a little bit and try to reduce it and make it as as user more user friendly and less like hacky. 
Um, but this is one of the features that stayed. Um, uh, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> There's also a documentation online where you can read through uh, all the features of Zinc Track. Um, so I hope the tutorials somehow explain uh, the features. So, uh, right, I want to come back here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this product update video, please like and subscribe. Thanks, Stevie. And feel free to post comments and questions below. Beyond our tools themselves, we have many resources for you on your ML journey. Visit our docs, our blog for tutorials, our YouTube channel, our Discord server for support and community, and our free online course. You can find all the links to these resources in the description. Thanks for making it to the end. Devi and I will see you in the next video.